Well, here we are, Keith. Here um, we are. I'm excited about our topic today. He uh, decided to speak about spirituality and the shadow. And this is something that I think is a really juicy topic in and of itself. It's definitely but, juicy if we talk about my spiritual shadow, but <laughs> we might not. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to speak about other people's shadows. and now I'd Jesus. rather speak about others, but <laughs> if we need to, we could get into our own. Yeah. <laughs> We've both had some really interesting experiences in communities and uh, it's a spiritual communities are, are, are really uh, interesting places for the shadow to be amplified and, and, and shown you know, like I think about like a Bugs Bunny cartoon with the, like the shadow of the monster in the wall. That's like 50 times bigger than the monster itself. And that's how I think about <laughs> what happens. And in Elmer Fudd's running around with a shotgun, like yeah. everywhere, just randomly <laughs> messing stuff up in the community. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my experience of spiritual communities for sure. Yeah. Well, where should we start? Well, I know we're going to tell some stories to kind of have fun with and then talk about those stories. And do you want to tell a story? You want me to start us off? Well, I think what I would be curious to hear from you about is like, what, what actually led you into spiritual, like looking for spiritual communities or being open to a spiritual community in the first place? That's a good question. So uh, this is this is the story I think that I was just thinking about to talk about is meeting my first guru whose shadow got played out in his community that I ended up becoming a part of. So I'll start there. I'll, I, I won't tell it too long. I'll condense it down and then we can kind of play with that, right? So my uh, inclination, I think, started where it really kicked off was which I've talked about in many places, this psilocybin journey when I was 19 and I started thinking differently. And then fast forward to around 21, 22, um, I was actively in my head thinking I'm a spiritual person and that I was special, which I obviously wasn't more special than anyone else, but I thought I was because I thought I was a spiritual person. And I was thinking that way. And I was like longing for spiritual practice because I grew up Jewish and that those practices weren't calling me at that time as a spiritual practice for myself. And I was wanting something else. And I knew it was like Eastern and, and I was just intuitively going, I need to learn yoga. Now, What's a little hard for some listeners right now, depending on age, is that 20, what was this, 20, almost five years, 25 years ago, where I was in the country and in most parts of the country, like nobody was talking about yoga 25 years ago, like in little pockets they were. But in most of the country, nobody even could define yoga 25 years ago. Um, So I was in Vermont. There was very little yoga anywhere around me. I mean, there was not, there was no yoga around me. And so I was just intuitively asking for yoga. I was like, I need to meet my teacher. I need a practice and I need community. So the the long story short here is, and you've heard this story. I I'm living on this magical house that I kind of manifested up on the largest Southern peak in Vermont, overlooked three States. And, uh, I had to leave this house and it was a totally very um, sad time for me that I had to leave this house. Like this house was so spiritual to me. And it was like, that was my meaning in the moment of spirituality was nature. And I had to leave and I'm pulling out of the driveway on the day that I'm leaving. I was renting it and up comes this guy and he's probably 65 years old. He's bald he looks unique to me and he walks over to me. I'm like, how you doing? And I tell him a little about the house. And he says to me, Oh, this land is so spiritual. I was like, it's, I was like, thanks for saying that. Like I, it's nice to hear someone say that. And he says to me, why don't you come back here? Are you interested in learning meditation with me? I like to teach people meditation. And I was like, yeah, I would love that. So I start going back. I'm, I'm, I had a move about an hour away. I drive back like four days a week. Um, this is one hour each direction, four days a week. Yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. I was okay. super like psyched about this. Um, commuting to my yoga, my meditation mentor, essentially. And he's teaching me yogic philosophy. And then as he kind of warms up to me after maybe it was two months, I don't know what it was. He starts telling me that he was Yogi Amrit Desai. Yogi Amrit Desai now is one of the, it's one of the people that brought yoga to the West in 1967. Well, that's when he started teaching. Uh, in so the this West. is you and Amrit Desai this is me in a house. and not Amr Desai yet. Oh, so he tells me this man's name is Frank. So thank you, Frank, because he was my first mentor, spiritual teacher in a certain way. He tells me after about two months, he warms up to me more, and he's Frank was the lawyer of Yogi Amr Desai. And Yogi Amr Desai, we're going to talk about shadow here. Yogi Amr Desai uh, was the founder of Kripalu, even though they won't say that if you go there because of what they decided because of their shadow, I think. Um, we'll talk about this. Uh, so he tells me he was his lawyer for the process when Yogi Amrit Desai in 1994, this was 97, got kicked out of Kripalu for some sexual issues that happened with, with uh, some of the disciples. It was an ashram. It was a celibate ashram. Um so he tells me this and he's like, you know, um, the Yogi Amrit Desai is going to start coming here and he wants to hold for, you know, whoever small, you know, community satsang and teach yoga and, and lead satsang. And so I was like, oh my God, like I've been waiting for my teacher. I don't know who this guy is at all. I knew nothing about him. I knew nothing about yoga. I was like, great. So then he starts coming there and it's me, Frank. Sometimes I have a friend or two and that's it. And we're all sitting around. He's got his harmonium. If you ever, anyone who knows Yogi Amar Desai, he's got his harmonium and he's doing these, you know, the Kundalini chanting and all this different stuff. But then he's also teaching me like deep philosophy of yoga and movement postures and like the real heart of what movement does somatically in our body and our nervous system and our ego. Oh, wow. So that's how I met my teacher. And that's, you know, how it came to me. And I, got brought in to the spiritual world. And then I went and lived at Kripalu on and off for a year. Uh, he was obviously not there at the time and got brought into this world. And I obviously got exposed to someone whose shadow uh, material as a guru, you know, hurt a lot of people at Kripalu and then got to be at the community in 98, I think is when I was first at the community, 99, uh, and you know, got to talk to a lot of people that I, he's teaching me and these people hated him. They hated him. They, they were like, you know, and whatever I said, like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm studying with this guy. And they're like, Oh my God. Like <laughs> he was Voldemort. Like you don't say his name. Like that's what it was. Voldemort. <laughs> so, so there's a lot we could unpack about spiritual uh, shadow here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, had, he was Voldemort for sure. And it was definitely, you know, Kripalu back then. 25 years ago was definitely Hogwarts. I mean, it was, a, <laughs> it was an interesting place. So, all right. So I'll pause there. Okay. So, um, so many questions. What, what I'm struck with is, is how many parallels there are in what you were experiencing and what I experienced in the late nineties. You're, you're younger than me. So my, I guess arguably my spiritual journey um, didn't start until uh, later uh, in my life, like five years after yours, your, your age. Um, but it was a similar phenomenon of getting involved in, in a community that had already been impacted by the kind of breakdown of, uh, of the guru. This was, I'm talking about getting involved in, uh, Tibetan Buddhism in the late nineties, when, uh, the guru that's who started in Europa, Ch Chogyam Trungpa died in 87 from basically alcoholic liver failure. Um, and, uh, and there was all kinds of problems in that community that followed that from his Dharma heir and what happened with him and, um, uh, details that, are not really relevant here that, you know, predated my involvement, but the, um, the thing that I'm really struck with is the polarity in the community, right. That, that you were 
stepping into Kripalu at a time when there must have been a big injury in that community from what Amr Desai was exposed about with sexual behavior with students right, and stuff. Right. Yeah. And he, now, which community are you? Are, did you start with Shambhala or you started with Dharma Ocean? Dharma Ocean was a little later, right? Yeah. I um, I went to my first meditation retreat in I think it was the year 2000 was the late at the end of the year 2000. So it was 22 years ago at Shambhala mountain center. And it was led by Reggie Ray who had his own community. Yeah. And I might as well just say that for me, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't actually aware that there was such a huge spiritual injury in me that uh, was driving this hunger for something real and spirituality. Um, you mentioned your experience with Judaism and not feeling connected to the teachings. I, you know, I was uh, brought up Methodist and the experience of church and all that, that whole scene felt very dry and kind of unsatisfying and um, didn't, didn't capture my attention at all really as a kid. And I was a seeker uh, looking around and trying out different things and ended up um, on this meditation cushion at Shambhala Mountain Center in, in the year 2000. And I heard Reggie Ray speaking the Dharma, Tibetan Buddhism, and I just had tears running down my face. It was like, I, I finally felt like I heard someone in, with spiritual authority speaking something that made sense to me. It felt like coming home. And so later on, when my relationship with Reggie deteriorated, it was just it was very devastating because it was sort of the first time that I spiritually felt like I had a place and a home and a community. And, and that was a, that was a brutal kind of devolvement later. Uh, but it was interesting to notice myself um, making, I would say making uh, excuses or making it okay. Some of the things that were not okay about the way my teacher treated other people and treated me like using um, spiritual teachings to justify or explain or erase somehow what, when I look back on it was clearly abusive behavior and abusive speech and um, paranoia and, you know, just uh, distortions of anger basically. Um, yeah. Well, let's start there. On, so I think this is, so obviously we're talking today about spirituality and shadow, right? Yeah. Um, let's start with you and I in terms of the shadow that led us to even seek out spirituality. And then let's talk about the shadows we found in our spiritual communities. Yeah. And I think that that's an interesting conversation. I, I recently was thinking that... Um, if you don't have me mental illness and you quote unquote have mental health, well, then you have basic insanity. You're not sane <laughs> by any means. <laughs> I mean, you know, right. you're still right. flipping out 20 times a day in your head and you got all these crazy yeah. thoughts and gosh, if anyone knew what you were thinking all day long, they'd be like, you're insane. Right. Some of the thoughts that pass through every human being's heads all day. Right. So to me, I was thinking recently, like the spiritual path is, is really where, you know, mental health begins, uh, which is basic insanity. Uh, and, you know, obviously the spiritual path was developed so long ago for the fact that uh, everyone is suffering inside themselves um, and that there needs to be an answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a basic suffering that is um, a part of the apparatus that we're it's part of the um, the ego, right? The way the way we perceive reality. There's a basic yeah. sense of dissatisfaction that's always there. Right. Yeah. So my shadow that drove me into the spiritual traditions, the shadow was wanting to be special, and I didn't. You know, when I was in the um, in the yoga traditions in my twenties. I thought I was, um, uh, so one part of me, which I think is true, I was just seeking truth 
right? But the shadow was that I was uh, seeking something special and to be special in some way. Um, and at the enlightenment path would have given me that. If I achieved something along that path, I would have become very special and had a very special experience. Uh, because the shadow is that I was obviously feeling very not special and in a lot of pain. And I wanted, you know, part of the shadow too was I wanted to be special. And also I um, didn't want to be, to have to feel pain. Mm. Like that's a shadow. I didn't want to actually have to experience pain in the human body. Right. And that's right. a shadow, right? When we don't want to have to experience pain in the human body, um, that leads to a lot of problems in the world. So I'll just say for myself that I think there was a, a few different elements. One is like I opened to realities, you know, that in terms of uh, peak experiences, mystical states, where I'm like, there's so much more going on here. There's such a deeper process happening. I want to know the truth. Um, and then it was also some shadow material of like, I'm in deep pain. I don't believe in myself. I want to be known. I want to be seen. I want to be special. I want to be, have a special experience. My experience is already more special than anyone else's. Uh, and so I might as well go uh, be with myself on a cushion or on a yoga mat because I already have the coolest experience. <laughs> so that was my shadow that got played out, I think, too. But I'll, I'll pause there. I don't know if you have any insights yourself of, was there any shadow that drove you into that path? No, there was no shadow for me. Yeah. No, you keep <laughs> you keep telling me that. That's See, the problem. That's, no. I'm special. I, yeah. I'm, I'm special enough. You have enough no shadow. I, <laughs> you know? I, I, think, I think I had, um, among other things, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is I had a big injury with authority uh, because my experience of authority growing up was pretty, uh, spotty, if you will. I, I don't remember seeing a healthy leader, uh, archetype in my environment as a child. And so I wasn't aware that I didn't have that, of course. And so when the spiritual teacher, I gravitated toward started, um, displaying shadow, uh, it was, there was a lot of cognitive dissonance. There was a lot of like, I don't want to see um the the shadow of this person because i would have to look at i would have to see my own shadow so i think a big part of the shadow for me that that drew me to sort of a more domineering kind of like um controlling kind of spiritual teacher was not um having a healthy experience of leadership in my mm -hmm. uh in my earlier experiences and I mean, it's, it's kind of a cliche that, you know, people throw around of, you know, spiritual communities are full of people with, uh, authority issues or daddy issues or whatever mommy, if it's a maybe female spiritual teacher, but I was definitely one of those people who had all kinds of, uh, injuries with, uh, with my parents that I absolutely projected onto, to the teacher, um, full on. And, you know, when, I think when things, when the power is held in a, in a skillful way, then that reflection can be made back to the student and the person can grow up. Right. And, 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 uh, so I, I do hold out that that is a possibility that that can happen well. And, uh, <laughs> and I did grow up, um, to some degree, but it was, it was a distorted mirror for sure that I, uh, called in. You're, you're actually, I'm so glad you, you brought this awareness out because this was definitely one of my shadows too, which is that so many people are drawn to spiritual teachers in a fantasy of a perfected mother or father figure Yeah, and that they're going to be perfect. And that whatever that means in your own fantasy, right? That there's, they're, go, they're, they're going to be perfect in your fantasy of what they will do and won't do ever. Right. And they're the going to be, time. if there are a hundred students, there's a hundred different fantasies that the teacher's yeah. dealing with. Well, and, and what tends to happen is many spiritual teachers actually cross social norms in a huge way in inappropriateness and really crush those fantasies right. uh, in, in hurtful ways. But so, but I'm glad you brought this up because I came into a situation with a teacher where I 
brought that shadow of I'm this teacher is perfected, even though I had already known that he had already, you know, went through a devastating process with a community just a few years before. Mm -hmm. And I was still playing that out with him of like, Mm -hmm. Oh, look at him and how he talks. And like, he never has, he never gets emotional and like, he never gets upset. And Mm -hmm. like, you know, I was playing all that out of like, he's always Mm -hmm. so loving and, um, now, granted, this this human being, even though he, which we can get into the ego shadow, um, he actually is one of the more loving human beings I have ever met. But that's just a personality thing, I think. Um, so there's this piece of we come just to talk. Like I think as a baseline, a lot of people do come into wanting a teacher in, in spirituality, especially I think when we're younger. Um, mm-hmm often playing out wanting a perfected mother or father figure. Oh, for sure. uh, In their life. For sure. For sure. And then, um, there was a whole nother funny episode apropos of what you're talking about, where I, in my twenties, I, I went and, you know, found this kind of father figure who I idealized in this, in this way that we're talking about. And then when that broke down in my thirties, I went and found uh, a very feminine, teacher almost like uh-huh. as a reaction still an unconscious thing i think in my system in my shadow it's like oh i don't want this kind of hyper masculine like rigid you know controlling domineering angry person and then i went and found this other guru who also ended up getting canceled for transgressions with students but it was a much more feminine presentation interesting in the energy yeah. so you you went to you went to both mom. And I went dad. to dad first and then mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, it doesn't sound, that's quite what happened to your childhood. Maybe you went to mom first, but I don't yeah, know. For sure. <laughs> you went to mom first. For sure. Yeah. 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 But that wasn't even by choice. <laughs> yeah. No, there was a bunch bigger father wound than a mother wound. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, I think another next piece is just exploring within community. Well, let's actually explore the shadow and the teacher for a moment, which I, I, I find kind of very interesting, which is, you know, I, I talk about, I think about spirituality, a lot of, there's so many different traditions and so many different practices and teachings and amazing stuff out there. I mean, I've learned so much in a lot of the spiritual communities I've been in. And, but I also often think about these are, they're not necessarily psychological growth oriented, um, paths, um, where you're, where you're actually facilitating a path of relational healing and interpersonal, uh, communication healing and, and sort of finessing the ego and nervous system to relate better to each other. That's not, doesn't tend to be the spiritual community scene. Um, although they're out there, uh, Mm -hmm. but, especially in more of the Eastern traditions, it tends to be more about working with self to uh, transcend aspects of self that are, you know, you know, get in the way or whatever it's talked about in so many ways. Right. So in a lot, you know, I've met a lot of gurus as, as you have, and many of the gurus I've met have sort of had a fall from grace uh, in their communities. Um, if I actually, when I was working with, uh, Amr at the side at the time, I met Andrew Cohen. Do you know who that is? What is enlightenment? Do you remember this guy? I don't, I don't know his work. No, he fell I've heard his name too. before, but he had a big fall from grace too. Oh, okay. um, I didn't study much with him, but so, you know, I kept seeing these gurus go through these problems in my twenties. Um, and I started really wondering what's going on. Um, why is it that you can do something where you transcend a lot of this emotional fluctuation and disturbance? And I, I believe a lot of the people I met did that, that they transcended a ton of the disturbing, emotional, gripping things that most people go through. Yet they played out ego driven, seemed like ego driven um, shadow material that really impacted a lot of people and more, didn't have the capacity from many of people I saw to do healthy repair. Um, 
So I'm curious if we talk about that of the shadow, just in a lot of spiritual communities and spiritual teachers, if we start with teachers of like, what's going on there, you know, why is it, if you can sort of move through the ego structure and transcend it to a degree, uh, is it still there to cause havoc on the world? (laughs) What's that about? Yeah. I mean, what I'm wondering as I'm listening to you talk about transcending the ego, like, is it actually transcended? Uh, is it, is it integrated or is it bypassed, you know, and, and I'll just speak from my own experience there because I, you know, I got so deep into Tibetan Buddhism. I was, I was practicing at least an hour a day for eight years. I spent a year in retreat, some of it solitary, some of it group retreat, but over the period of an eight year period, while I had a career and a daughter at home, I was doing a ton of meditating and what I got really good at was uh, deeply knowing myself on the cushion. And I got really good at compartmentalizing my emotions. But whenever I got um, triggered in the right way, you know, it was a huge flare of my egoic, of my injuries, you know, my trauma. And so um, it leaves me wondering with these kind of cancellations and kind of me too situations that happen with gurus, are they, are they just like 10 times more able to compartmentalize emotions than I got to in my, you know, stint in, you know, committing really deeply for eight years? Uh, Because if the interpersonal dimensions of how the ego functions is, is so uh, impaired still, is that really, how wakeful is that person? Yeah, this is a very important, fascinating topic of what's actually happening uh, in deep meditative cultivation over time where you're, let's say you are, so what I was achieved in my 20s in yoga and meditation was I got to pretty, I would say significant states of thought cessation and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like early, early Samadhi states, nothing like, you know, what gurus get to, but, but that I would achieve those regularly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's an interesting question of, was I bypassing ego? Um, I think that I was bypassing ego and those, the cultivation of the more um, limitless uh, spaces and non-dual spaces also are very important and relevant in terms of living a well life for myself. That I don't, I don't actually practice returning to those right now at all. Um, but so it, it, I do think I was bypassing ego because. Uh, you know, by my late twenties, uh, my ego was right there still. And, and yeah, I actually had a little window where I was getting, I think more relative emotional stability for a little while there when I was practicing really hardcore, um, where the fluctuations were kind of slowing down, Mm -hmm. but yeah, my ego was right there, ready to cause, ready to go (laughs) screw something up or screw (laughs) someone up. Yeah, uh, at every moment. So, um, and we see that right with gurus. So, I think there's, I, I, I think a bypassing happens. I think some integration happens too, when you practice a lot. I think it's both. Um, but the problem is, is like unless you're going to sit in a cave and yeah. have no relationship to another human being or object for the rest of your life, uh just bypassing the ego to get to non-dual states and stay there doesn't necessarily make you a highly functioning human being in relationship to another human being, uh, right. You know, just to do that only. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's, that's exactly what happened to me is making that realization that you just said is like, my practice is not translating into me being uh, more patient, more kind, more generous, less reactive in my intimate relationships, 
you know, where you, you're more likely to get triggered more easily in your intimate relationships than people you're not as intimately connected with. So that's where I realized for me that sitting meditation was going to be a part of my journey, but it wasn't going to take, I wasn't going to get home only with that. Right. And that's, yeah. I know that's when ayahuasca came in the scene for me. Oh, the interesting, which, yeah. which was, which was my first exposure to psychedelics in my life. Uh-huh. Oh, you hadn't done psychedelics before ayahuasca? No, not at all. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. I was a late, <laughs> late on the scene. You're a late bloomer. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not an old soul. Who's I was nearly bloomer. 40 when I took a psychedelic for the first time. Wow. Okay. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good for you. <laughs> you, you. It's probably a good thing. There was more support <laughs> systems around you. <laughs> <laughs> you had some knowledge under your belt to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was definitely um, in a deeply ceremonial and, you know, ritualized and traditional indigenous, uh, setting that, yeah. you know, and it was some years after I studied with Peter Levine and got, you know, more familiar with somatic, uh, trauma work. And it, it was very much for me, a journey of healing trauma is what that was all about. And to try to complement what I was, the gains that I felt like I was making on the cushion. Uh, but yeah, the interpersonal, it's really interesting how, from my experience, meditation never impacted my interpersonal experience. Not very much. Well, I think, I think that, you know, no matter how much you can, uh, merge with the light and shine the light, you cannot remove the shadow that you're casting. Right. You can't right. get that much light. Exactly. Like, we've yeah. seen it with every single guru. So yeah, it doesn't that work I've that way. Followed. I mean, sure. You know, people might be listening right now going, well, I've got a teacher. That's perfect. But you know, it does, I don't, it's, it doesn't seem like it works that way that you can actually get to that much light that you have no shadow. <laughs> I'm reminded of, um, you were talking about Hogwarts a minute ago, and I, I, I'm reminded of this scene often because one of my spiritual teachers loved, uh, Lord of the Rings and especially this scene where Dumbledore, uh, not Dumbledore, uh, Gandalf is standing on this ledge and he's fighting a dragon and he puts his staff down. And he says, none shall pass to the dragon. Yeah. And the dragon yeah. gets really mad and he, he stands his ground. But yeah. what my guru loved was the fact that, that Gandalf turned around and he started to walk away and the dragon's tail grabbed him and took him down. Uh-huh. And I didn't read the books. I watched the movies, but he comes back from Gandalf, the, the gray to Gandalf, the white, and he hangs out down there with the dragon in hell for who knows how long before he comes back renewed. But the point being that like he gets actually taken down by the arrogance of his shadow. Right. Of turning around before the job was done of, of yeah. staring down this aspect of himself, right. if you will. Right. You know? So, so, I mean, that's, I love that. And, you know, I love <laughs> fantasy and sci-fi movies. So yeah. I'm like visualizing the scene right now. Yeah. I, exactly. I could tell you how many uh, scales were on that dragon. Cause I have that weird way of knowing about movies, but <laughs> yeah. so, um, yeah, I, uh, I think that, you know, there's, there's some great spiritual communities out there and scenes we've been a part of them. Sure. There's some really great stuff that are incorporating all kinds of, you know, psychology is coming more and more into right. many spiritual communities. And, and with that said, I think that, uh, what's hard is that, you know, I think a lot of people turn toward the spiritual path because of the pain in their shadow. Of course. I mean, a lot of, yeah. I mean, why else would you need it? Yeah. It's right? painful. It's yeah. painful. And it's like, why else would you go looking for something that's different unless you've got some pain somewhere inside of you or some disconnection right. that's really causes a deep longing. And, um, and, uh, you know, the, the traditions are new that relatively in terms of civilization, where we're really getting to talk about, you know, socialization, nervous systems and right. uh, interpersonal development and, and developmental psychology is fairly new when you think about the timeline of things. And sure. so these spiritual traditions that are still here and, and many of the teachings, you know, they, they they're getting slowly, uh, incorporated into some new understanding and philosophies, but a lot of them are still right. Like 
very simple. And the sciences work to some degree where it's like, here's how you practice meditation. It's been being practiced the same way, this teaching mm. for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does something inside of you if you do it enough. Right? Sure. And yeah. there's you know, some amazing good. resources out there. Amazing. Right. For, for using. And, and it causes something, right? It causes this, this process to happen in you if you do these things. Um, and, you know, now we're having these conversations of there might uh, be even more integrative path where, well, if you're going to cause that process to happen, which we could somewhat call the vertical path, um, mm -hmm. can you also be on this horizontal path causing something else to happen if you're going to be in the world and yeah. relate to people? Like what's the, what, how do you, how do you actually deal with the egos, uh, you know, the function of the ego and the nervous system that, you know, forms the ego essentially, like, how do you, how do you deal with that in a way that you're, you're working on shadow to maybe create a more harmonious self and society. And also maybe you're choosing to work on the vertical path um, in some way, right. Where you're doing both. Yeah, I mean, I think they, under ideal circumstances, they complement each other, right? So, for example, uh, I try, I mean, I'm, I have the blessing of a, a, a partner, a wife who actually wants to grow relationally and cares a lot about growing relationally, you know? And, and so um, the way they, for me, one example of how they complement each other is I get uh, better at interpersonal relationship when I use mindfulness to slow myself down, uh, inside of a painful moment, painful moments happen, you know, in relationships that you care about. And so I can actually, on a good day, I can actually use my uh, mindfulness practice to pause and breathe and, re you know, reconnect with the, uh, introspection, the witness, witnessing ego of what's going on here. Oh, I'm curious again. You know, I, I, I found my way back to curiosity. Something I've learned a lot from Krista is like, where's your curiosity, mister? <laughs> I'm not feeling your curiosity is something she says when I'm not there, you know, because it's not there. Right. The self-defense fight or flight system doesn't have curiosity. Not that kind. The self-defense flight or flight system is not curious. about anything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it doesn't want to learn anything new. That's it doesn't sure. want to learn anything. It's like, I know exactly what I'm going to do here. <laughs> Don't tell me anything different. Exactly. Which is the, which is, I mean, in a certain way, just this whole conversation of spirituality and shadow work, it's like, you know, some people call this animal mind, uh, in certain traditions and divine mind, animal mind, uh, you know, there's different yeah. terms for this, right. But so, you know, animal mind when you're in this fight, flight, freeze, now collapse, we can keep going. There's a lot of work yeah. to this thing, but um, yeah, there's no, in that system and train of thought, there's no, uh, there's no want or desire to learn anything. It's yeah. actually just about preservation in that moment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Preserving, there's a preserving an old identity is what it's about. Well, right. Not not only old on a personal level, which I think is what you're saying, but also on an ancient uh, developmental level, you know, because right. there is this um, in the anatomy of the brain, there's this thing called the tentorium and there's what happens above the tent and what happens below the tent and below the tent is kind of what you're talking about is like that amygdala, you know, brainstem whole situation that takes over and the blood flow to the top part of the brain, the human part of the brain isn't really happening as, as effectively as it, as it does in these more dynamic human, creative, uh, curious states. Right. And, and a lot of people and when we seek spiritual paths or wanting, you know, I think there's, a, there's different spectrums. Some people are wanting to tame that, uh, to tame that beast and, you know, we'll live with that, work with it, use it for the, for the better in themselves, create a strength out of it, out of the animal mind. 
Other people are going to the spiritual paths because they want out of that. They want out right. of the system entirely. And, and yeah. can I erase this? Yeah. Can I, is there a way to hit delete uh, and restore and it doesn't reappear? Right. Uh, which again, certain, certain spiritual teachers will teach that that's true. You can do that, that you can completely eradicate the fluctuations of the ego state entirely. Some teachers teach that, that that's a possibility. Um, and many of those teachers, I've seen them do things where I'm like, I don't <laughs> think, I think that was the ego fluctuation. Um, yeah. So it's interesting when we think a shadow of, um, you know, shadow also lives in this state, right? In this lower brain state of, or lower parts of the brain. And like a lot of shadow material come from not relating to this of part of self. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. That's what we're talking about. And, you know, in shadow is denial of essential parts of our animal nature. Right. Uh, the, the kinds of um, motivations that are unsavory for us to allow other people or even ourselves to know about ourselves. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. Um, is shadow the denial of animal nature or shadow the denial of divine nature? Um, yeah. It's an interesting question. Like, is, is the shadow the expression of denying divine nature and then animal nature shows up in the denial of the divine um or is or is it both or is shadow also the denial of your animal instincts inside of you uh and then you're kind of playing them out unconsciously i mean i know there's that language right like what i, I maybe we should also define what we're talking about here in terms of what 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 yeah. this term means to us that's a good idea. I thought about that about an hour ago, and then we went into our conversation. <laughs> but well, uh, we do that. People I, have I to think keep, people have to keep up with us. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the the most um, helpful kind of understanding of what is sacred is all of it. That nothing is excluded from what's sacred, but our our ego wants to has opinions about what's profane and what's sacred. And so we, we separate things. And so we might say the animal minds over here and here's the, you know, spiritual mind. But, uh, to me, the animal mind is a, uh, part of what is sacred about us as human beings, about everything there is, right? Everything's included. So it is a denial it's sort of both. It's a denial of, to me, I'm just sharing my opinion about it, that, that denying our animal nature is a denial of our spiritual nature also, because the, the animal is also spiritual. Uh, it's just a different manifestation of spirit or, or sacredness uh, that has a, a kind of a grosser, kind of more coarser flavor to it, you know? Um hitting each other on the head with, you know, clubs is a coarser version of what we're capable of, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's sort of a both and response to your question of like, what is it? Are we denying spiritual or are we denying the animal, you know? Yeah. Well, maybe shadow for, I mean, how we're talking about it today, obviously there's like shadow work and, depending on the tradition, there's, you know, Jungian and there's other things, but like, sometimes we're talking about retrieving parts of self and that are in, that have been denied and disowned and dismembered from ourselves. Right. Um, other people, you know, talk about it just as unconscious, conscious, uh, pre-conscious things and their shadow language there. But in some ways, like when I think of shadow, um, I, I, I'm a little simpler in my kind of language. I'm, I just think of shadow as any material about ourselves that we are denying becoming aware of into uh, full conscious awareness. 
And that shadow is the result of that denial. Um, we're casting a shadow through that denial about ourselves. And we're saying that that shadow over there is not ours. Um, yeah. We're not that shadow. We're, we're this, we're not that. And then that shadow gets to actually live and play out things that we claim we didn't know or have control over. Yeah. You're, you're talking just for clarification, you're talking about denial. That's an unconscious process, not, um, a conscious denial of something. Yeah. 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 I mean, conscious denial is a very, that's a, that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. Can you actually consciously deny anything? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't think about really a pink do. elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't know if True. you can actually consciously deny anything, but you're right. Like I, I, I know from like a more psychoanalytic perspective, we would talk about it in that way. Um, yeah. 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 I think just to, to make it the point even more clear, I think, um, we're talking about one place where this comes up is power dynamics, right? Where someone is playing out something inside of their psychology that they don't know about. They, they're not consciously aware of it, but the other person is feeling it, is feeling the impact of um, a, a misuse of power, whether it's, you know, overuse or underuse or distortions of power, different ways. Okay, yeah, let's bring this back to the spiritual community scene then to make this very practical now. So um, I think a part of what's going on where a lot of gurus, you know, do things that have a very negative impact on people, a lot of inappropriate boundary violations, these kinds of things, right? Um, in terms of, are they actually consciously thinking about this thing? No. They're not like problem. I don't know who the person is, but like in terms of conscious versus unconscious shadow, like they're, they're probably not like actively some of these more developed gurus thinking like, yeah, I know this part of myself. I'm going to go play it out and do this X, Y, and Z in terms of in their um, discursive thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the shadow is that in the sort of more non-discursive thinking core belief system, even lower implicit systems of, uh, identity. Uh, there are these things that exist there in the, in people that we have denial systems built around to not allow us to confront them. Right. Um, and so they stay down there. They stay, they stay suppressed and repressed. They might be intergenerational. I mean, there's all kinds of ways these shadow material gets developed into our nervous systems and our identity. Uh, and so I think in the, the spiritual systems, the thing is, is that I don't believe that necessarily a lot of the meditation systems that were developed necessarily take you through that whole journey of getting into that material. Um, you know, they, it definitely will take you through the, uh, releasing, uh, aversions to pain and attachments to pleasure in your, mm -hmm. in your psyche. Right. Those systems do that, right? Like they're good at that where you can actually like release the, the grips on what you're attached to in your psyche and release the, the aversions mm -hmm. of what you don't want in your psyche, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily going to take you down into some of the more nuanced things in the implicit systems where it's not explicit and discursive where we're like disowning parts of self and right. wherever I came from. And those things get played out um, over time. And that's where I think we see a lot of shadow in spiritual communities is when we don't have other systems in place and there are always going to be shadow in any human being. Yeah. That's the other uh, piece, right? Exactly. I was going to, I was going to add to that exactly that, um, what we're talking about, I mean, when, when shadow gets gnarly is when people can't take responsibility for when it comes out. And the point here is that um, shadow is a natural and unavoidable aspect of human nature, right? It's just part of human nature. But I think what happens for people, and I'm including myself on the spiritual path, is that you you get an idea that a more evolved person maybe has less shadow or maybe has less 
afflicted thinking or less attachment. And then you start thinking, well, if your ego starts thinking, if, okay, I need to deny, this is where the ego pretends to be enlightened, right? And we get into these false um, states, or we, we think that we're further along than we actually are, or we actually think we have a wrong view that the shadow goes away if you get more enlightened, right? And so then anytime we have like a negative or a, a, a down thought, we're, we're even less likely to be able to, if we have a spiritual ego that we've developed, right? We're less likely to be able to take responsibility and say, oh, I just had a, I just wanted to kill that person over there who um, coughed in the middle of my meditation and screwed up my meditation. Yeah. <laughs> because if I have that thought, it's evidence that I'm less enlightened than I thought I was. Right. So it drives all these things down. <laughs> you start comparing yourself. So you got to start comparing yourself to an idolized version of exactly uh, not being human. Exactly. Right. Of of not having any human experience anymore. Exactly. Right. That's the you you create a fantasy of a non-human experience that you project onto gurus. This is, I think, a part of the work, though. I mean, this is a part of the spiritual path is to work with that projection um, and to notice it that like you keep doing that, but then you end up right back where you are at, yeah. at the end of the day, when you get off your cushion, you walk, you, you know, you, you go down and I was in a, uh, a going of a passion retreat in Massachusetts, a 10 day. Did you ever do mm -hmm. a going retreat? No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. But you've done like, I know what they you know, are. They're like yeah. a 10 day silent. Yeah. And you know, I was like in a really good space at toward the end. And we're let me ask you out. something just, yeah. just for the audience, because I want to clarify this. Cause my understanding is in the traditional re Goenka retreats, you are very much in like solitary confinement for 10 days, right? They you're, you, are you like, there a, uh, are different, room? there are different okay. ones. This right. one, this one was, uh, you know, you're outside in a, tent where you slept at night with one other person and there was a meditation hall with oh, okay. people but you're not allowed to look at other people that's All the right. practice you don't All look right. and ever make eye contact or look at another person's body was the practice um so you're trying to be with someone okay. but anyway so i'm at the end of this thing and uh i had a very hard uh you know two-thirds of it was grueling of course for me um, and then the last third, I'm like starting to get into those states that I told you about. I'm like, oh my God, like I achieved something. And I walk out and we're breaking silence after 10 days and we go into the, the food hall and I walk out and I go to grab a, a bowl. I think it was cereal. I go to grab a bowl and this guy next to me grabs the bowl from me and he's like, that was mine. <laughs> I go, <laughs> and I was like, I felt this whole surge of like, you know, F you <laughs> for taking my cereal. <laughs> um, and, and I walked away and I'm like, did I achieve anything? <laughs> did anything change whatsoever? <laughs> That's great. I love that. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, right? Like it doesn't, the work of being human doesn't go away. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the work for me is like right now, the way I work with this material and I think about it is leaning in to um, wanting to see what's in the shadow. Uh, yeah. As well as, you know, whatever spiritual practices are there, but also just like, I want to know what's in that shadow even though, you know, I'll still claim every day when I get feedback from Emma that I don't, um, <laughs> I do ultimately when she points out the shadow, which she does very well. Um, and of course I still go into that system where I'm like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, a lot of truth in it and it is that. Um, and so, you know, I think that my current understanding here is like in, it's really about using the light of consciousness to actually shine it into the spaces that we don't want to look at. 
Um, and that's a part of the path is like actually developing a light so that you can actually have some light to go look at what's in there mm-hmm. instead of just being consumed by right. walking around in the darkness, bumping into walls and going, I don't know why that hurt. <laughs> I don't even know why I just bumped it. Like, I don't even know why that just hurt my face. Where'd that wall come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the most powerful teachings that, that happened for me early on that kind of burst the bubble that you know, more enlightened people experience less pain, uh, came from Adya Shanti. He's an amazing, you know, spiritual mm-hmm. teacher and someone who hasn't been canceled, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, so good right. for him. Um, but he said in a retreat, I was at pretty early on that, uh, the difference between, and I think this is a, an allegory in Buddhism. I don't think this was his words actually, but he said that um, the difference between an ordinary person feeling suffering and an enlightened person feeling suffering is it is the difference between feeling uh, the sensation of pulling a hair, a human hair across the palm of your hand is an ordinary person versus pulling a human hair across your eyeball is an enlightened person. <laughs> And so he said that basically um, enlightened people actually feel pain a lot more acutely because the the denial and the uh, dissociation isn't isn't there as much for them, mm-hmm. or maybe not at all. And so they actually feel the opposite of what my framework was in seeking spirituality in the first place was to get away from my suffering. That's awesome. I really <laughs> That's really helpful. That. Someone told me recently, this is different, but related. Someone told me recently that as we evolve, we have more opportunity through our day to be authentic. We have more opportunity because we notice the challenges historically where we would not be authentic and not recognize it. We would just go to sleep. Yeah. We actually notice the moments more as we get more and more evolved to enter into a state of authenticity uh, as we have more awareness because we can notice throughout the day more when we're having the seduction yeah. to not be authentic. Yeah, you the anesthesia is not as much in charge of your experience. Yeah. Right. You feel the pain more acutely of being inauthentic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's start to wrap up here on spirituality and shadow. There's no simple answers to this thing we call human experience. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a big play of, uh, things that we're all learning about and, um, growing through and a lot of shadow, a lot of shadow that we witness on this planet that we could bring light to. Uh, in communities all over the planet, a lot of shadow going on in this world. Yeah. And, and I guess for me, I just want to leave on the note that um, humor has always been an ally for me in uh, welcoming my shadow. Mm-hmm. If, if I can actually literally laugh at myself, not in a sarcastic or mean or shaming way toward myself, but actually wow, there I am again. And I'm just so human in this moment. And it's just like incredibly embarrassing. Like, you know, it's like, there I am. It helps. It helps. (laughs) I'll laugh at you also. (laughs) Thanks. Then you're in good company. Yeah. (laughs) I know humor is so key because, um, it's so key to take it, to take ourselves a little less seriously. Right. Exactly. And and just sort of play with that. And especially when we're confronted right? Confronted. The ego is confronted when we see so much pain and violence in the world. Like we're just confronted sure. by so many ways to just go into deep, deep, deep pain and constriction about reality. And, uh, but I like the humor piece and, and also just getting back into, you know, spreading the light into the shadow. I mean, that's where I think we can really do some damage and, uh, Mm -hmm. bringing light to the shadow. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's not about eradicating and destroying. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a, uh, 
that's that's a big hiccup uh and uh yeah it's, a, it's about bringing light and transforming uh and transmuting and mm -hmm. uh you know that i think that's where we could leave off shadows here to stay yeah and we and we don't have to I mean, we are, but we don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to be afraid of our own shadow. We can embrace it. We can learn from it. We can honor its sacred place in the right. constellation of what we are. Yeah. The Light and shadow. Of shadow. And, you know, when you go watch a play, there's shadow material in place <laughs> for a reason, right? Yeah. It's, there is a sacred place for shadow. And if we're not afraid, it, the more we're not afraid of our own and the more we actually relate to our own, the, the less afraid we'll be of the shadows we see around us. Yeah. That's playing out every day. And it gives us more opportunity to confront those things in the world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. One there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keith. All right. Bye. Bye.